Right, so this is our fourth Sunday here. The first one, of course, we didn't, I didn't preach. Uh, Pastor Aaron from Beer came and preached. So this is just my third Sunday. And so this is the final message of the trilogy that I've been preaching. And uh, the first week we spoke about in God we trust out of Psalm 91 verse 2. In God we trust. And we all, we're all challenged with the T word, with the trust word, and we're all growing. In that area, day by day, moment by moment, season by season. There are some seasons we find it easier to trust. There's other seasons that we don't find it uh, easy to trust. Then the second week, we spoke about the secret place out of Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells shall abide. He who dwells shall abide. He who dwells shall abide. Abide where? Well, we finished off that message last week about talking about what it means to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So today, we're going to finish with, well, who is the Almighty? Who is the Almighty? It's one thing to have trust, but who are we trusting in? Who or what are we putting our trust in? Are we putting our trust in our pension? Are we putting our trust in our superannuation? Are we putting our trust in the government? And everybody said, no. That's right. That's right. We're putting our trust in the living God. Psalm 20 verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So the title of my message today is Blind Trust? Question mark. Blind trust? Is the Christian faith a blind trust? Is that what it is? Question mark. Well, of course, the Christian faith is not a blind trust at all. When it comes to trusting God, there is evidence. But people have blind tr- bl- a blind faith, a blind trust. They have a blind faith in evolution. They do not have any facts to back it up whatsoever. Oh, but there's a gap. And oh, one day that gap will be fixed up. No, 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 hang on. Whoa, hang on. No, it won't. My Bible says that God said in Genesis 1, let there be light and there was light. That's it. People have blind faith in their mystic belief about what's going to happen to them when they die. But do they have any proof? Big fat zero proof. Atheists have blind trust in their atheistic beliefs, but they don't have any evidence at all or facts concerning that at all. But our faith in God is not blind, it has evidence. Come with me to John chapter 20, because here very clearly the scripture shows us that all of the gospel of John was written that we might have evidence that Jesus, the Son of God, is who he is. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. Everybody say that. But these are written. Look up here on the screen and read it out for me. But these are written. So that you may believe that Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. These are written. The word of God is infallible. The word infallible means it can't be wrong. It can't be wrong. Let that sink in for a little while. It's infallible. It can't. Oh, oh, oh. No, 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 no. It can't be wrong. God has spoken. That settles it. That's it. It's infallible. All of Scripture is evident to the fact of the trustworthiness of God. You only trust someone to the measure of truthfulness. If somebody lies to you and then they deny that they've lied to you, the golden thread of trust with that person has very much weakened. Many marriages fall apart, bust up, because one partner lies to the other and then denies it and then keeps doing it. Because where there is lies and deception, there is no rock-solid foundation to trust. If we're going to invest our money in a company on the stock markets. We better do our due due diligence and find out if they've got a rock-solid foundation of investment before we put our money in that investment. Well, I've invested and found out 
that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is worthy, hallelujah, of all my confidence and trustworthiness in Him. And I'm just saying today, from the last two messages that I preached, that if we are under the shadow of the Almighty, we're in a great place to be because He can be trusted with everything that we are concerned about, with every need that we have, with every desire that we have. We can place it in His hands. Faith in God is not blind. The facts still add up. Two plus two still equals four. And I'm sure if there's going to be some brain surgeon that's going to operate upon your brain, I'm sure you do not want him going on his feelings that day, but you want him to go on some rock-solid facts that he's looking at with x-rays and everything else and that he's going to follow those facts and do all that he's going to do in your brain on those facts and not his feelings. What am I saying? I'm saying the church has become weak in the 21st century because we depend upon our feelings far more than we depend upon digging in this book to discover who he is. That's what I'm saying. Church is not about coming and having a good feeling time. Church is about coming because I've read in this book during the week that he's worthy of my trust and worthy of my honor and worthy of my praise. And man, I'm going to give it all that I can when I come. That's what church is about. God's not dead. He's alive. Jesus declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can come to the Father. So he's the way to the Father. He's the truth of the Father. And he's the life of the Father, if you want life at all. That is resurrection life. That is so life, supernatural life. And of course, as we read the Word of God, we find that the evidence stacks up that He is the way, that He is the truth, and that He is the life. That brings me to another scripture that has been a constant blessing in my life. And I said this right on the first Sunday, that I'm going to preach in this early season as your pastor, out of those scriptures that have been wells and continue to be wells in my life. And this is another one, and it's still in the Old Testament. All right, so for three Sundays, I've stuck in the Old Testament. Next week, we're going to jump straight into the New Testament with a bang. Hallelujah, because it's Resurrection Sunday. And most of April is going to be in the New Testament as well, because we're going to go on to look at this great and awesome and wonderful gospel that is called the good news of Jesus Christ. So Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. This came into my heart years ago. It's never left my heart. And man, it challenges me every time I read it. And that's what the Word of God ought to do. Not condemn us. The Word of God never condemns. Never. We condemn ourselves. Our own sin condemns us. But the Word of God will never condemn us. But it will challenge us. It convicts us. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. What are we to boast in? What are we to glory in? What are we to get excited about? That we understand and know our God. Not know about him but that we know our God, that we know our God, that we understand and know our God. But notice he says there, right at the end of that verse, it says, for in these I delight. Who does he delight in? Well, he actually says it. He delights in those that glories in his understanding, not just has an understanding, not just growing in an understanding, but then they glory, they boast in their understanding to others. In other words, they testify of Jesus Christ. They testify of Jesus Christ. They have enough understanding from the Scriptures that they're able to tell others who Jesus Christ is. Or they're able to tell others what Jesus Christ has done in their life. That's a good start. In fact, that's the best place to start in testifying, if you don't know too much. Start with what He's done in your life and how he has changed your life. That's glorying. That's boasting. We can glory and boast in Christ. We sure can. All righty. So we know him only to the measure that he has revealed himself in Scripture or to the measure that we search him out. 
His, 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 his greatness is unmeasurable, limitless, infinite. But how great is your curiosity to know him? How strong is your appetite to taste and see that the Lord is good? That's a good question to ask regularly, isn't it? I think it is. It doesn't condemn me. It challenges me. I say, oh, Lord, I want to I press in even more. I want to know more. I want to set aside more time to know you. Jeremiah, of course, ex- ex- exhorted us that we would glory in knowing and understanding him. So the trustworthiness of our God. I want us to look at five attributes. We'll see if we get through the five or not. But I want us to look at five attributes of God. In other words, those aspects about God that show us something about God and point to exactly the nature of God so that we can put a clear handle on who God is. All right? It's factual. We have facts in the Word of God. God, This book is God revealing himself to us. He's revealing himself to us. It's a show and tell from our Heavenly Father. So the first attribute that we want to look at this morning is he's omniscient. He's omniscient. He is omniscient. The word, the, 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 the statement omni, it means all. So he's all knowing. He's all knowing. He's all present. He's everywhere, at all places, at all times. The essential attributes of our God. He's omniscient. He must know everything there is to know about me. He must know things ahead of time. He must know every single need that we have, our desires, our weaknesses, and our failures. He must know everything. Otherwise, let's not put our trust in this God who we call the living God. But if he does know everything about everything about everything about everything, then wow, we've got a rock-solid foundation to put our trust and faith in God. We have a little story here. I'm sure you, most of you know the story. Jesus said to his disciples they were coming from down the south in Jerusalem and they were heading north back up to Galilee. And, and, and the pure Jew would cross over the Jordan River. They would cross over it at Jericho and they'd go up the opposite side so that they would not go through Samaria. Oh boy, talk about bigotry. They would not go through Samaria. But Jesus said to his disciples as they were walking down the hill, some 22 kilometers from Jerusalem to Jericho, as they were walking down that hill, somewhere there, Jesus said to his disciples, we must go through Samaria. Why? Because God is omniscient. He had already said to his son that morning, you've got to go through Samaria because I've got a little job for you to do. I want you to go and sit down next to Jacob's well and a woman's going to come out and you're going to have a conversation and you're going to turn that whole town upside down and inside out for me. Wow. And in that conversation... Jesus, of course, reveals to this woman, you've had five husbands and the bloke you're living with right now is not your husband. Doesn't God cut through it all? But he doesn't do it to condemn. He does it so that we will be confronted with the reality in our life. And in that point of reality and clarity to our lives, we will turn to the one who can take it all away, all the shame, all the hurt, all the pain, take it all away and give us a brand new beginning. And he was standing right in front of her. His name is Jesus. And she ran back into the town. Now we know why she was there at midday. Because the women came out either first thing in the morning or late in the afternoon when they didn't have to battle with the heat of the day to carry their water back. She came out because everyone talked about her. And it wasn't good talk. So she came out all alone. And Jesus met her. And she ran back in and said, Come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Wow. I know that when I pray, I'm praying to a God who's already known what I'm coming to him about because he knows every thought in my heart, every secret thought in my heart he knows. I'm so glad. I'm not scared of that. I'm so glad about that because then I can bring it to him and give it to him and he can deliver and set me free and give me purity within and a joy without. I don't have to carry any ugly secret thought any second longer than I ought but I can bring it to a compassionate, forgiving, wonderful, awesome, heavenly Father. He knows all. 
Look at this uh, scripture in Psalm 139, verse 1 to 4. O Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Wow. My mother was able to convince me as a little child that she was omniscient. (laughs) <laughs> that she knew all. <laughs> but somewhere around about nine years of age, <laughs> I got this inkling that she didn't know all. And then that summer, she said something that convinced me that she didn't know all. Because she lined up my two older brothers and I, and she said, now you little rascals, you lot, I know you're heading over the paddock there into the bush to go play all day long because that's what we did back in the 60s. Ran across the bush and played in the bush all day long. Chased the kangaroos, chased the lizards, do other things. And she said, now I know there's a muddy dam up in that paddock and I know that you boys won't go swimming in that muddy dam because I'll smell the mud on you anyhow. Even if you go skinny dipping, I'll smell it. Well, I knew that summer that she wasn't omniscient because we went skinny dipping in that dam and she didn't know anything about it. She was not wise about it at all. We got away with it. And so that that thing continued that summer because mum wasn't omniscient and I was so glad about that. (laughs) Ah, but what an awesome mum she was. She was, but she's she's in heaven dancing around the throne and having a great time. God knows every detail happening on the earth, even in the future. And there's some amazing passages in the scripture that will light your imagination and your fire up about this. Take this one home and read this. Read 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. An incredible chapter. Samuel the prophet anoints Saul to be king. But before he leaves, the, rest, the whole lot of the chapter he goes on with exactly what's going to now happen. God downloads it to Samuel and Samuel says, you're going to go to this town and you're going to meet three men as they come out. One's going to have three goats he's going to be carrying. Another one's going to have two loaves of bread and another one's going to be doing this. And then he goes on and on and on and on and on with all this detail. Aren't you glad that your heavenly father has got every single bit of detail, even about your future, all nailed down? I am. So what are we worried about? What are we worried about? What are we anxious about? Jesus said in Matthew, he said, you can't even add any height to you by your anxiety, one bit. So why are you anxious? Father's got it all in control. If he sees the sparrows that fall to the ground, your father, heavenly father, and he knows every little sparrow that falls to the ground and die, what are you concerned about? In fact, he counts all the hairs on your head. He doesn't have to do much more counting on mine anymore. Hallelujah, more's dropping out. But he knows all about that. All right, second attribute of God says that God is able to be faithful and trustworthy because he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful, potent. He is all-powerful, totally, completely, and all power. Another place in the psalm says, uh, where, does God belong, where does power belong? Power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. We think we have power. We think the great athletes of the world have power. We think the billionaires have power. We maybe might think that uh, Mr. Putin has power. But I want you to know God has all power. He can't be faithful in every circumstance of your life if he's not powerful. Now that could be scary. If he's all powerful and a Putin. All powerful and an ugly, awful, evil dictator. Because then he can do some evil things in our lives. But he's not. My Bible says that his goodness flows like an awesome river, abounding and overflowing to those that desire it and want it and live pleasing unto him. His goodness abounds. So he's almighty, all-powerful, and it flows out of the goodness of his heart to your life all the time when you need it and call upon it. How good is he? Ephesians 1 verse 19. 
Ephesians 1, of course, from about verse 16 and on, Paul is praying for the believers at Ephesians. He could have prayed any prayer, but this is the prayer that he prayed. He prayed that, that God would grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened, illuminated, so that we could see and understand the awesome things that God has made available to us through salvation. That is our inheritance. That is our hope for eternity. And then the third one is the power, his mighty power. So let's read verse 19. I believe it's up there. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? Verse 20 says, the power that caused God to raise his son from the dead. Resurrection power, almighty power. That's what resurrection power is. It's almighty power. And notice the phrase here, immeasurable greatness, immeasurable greatness. There's no measure to the greatness of his power. He's omnipotent. He's omnipotent. You got some challenges? He's got the power. You got some challenges? He couples that with his goodness and mercy and kindness and grace. Wow. Wow, what a combination. What a combination to have in our lives. What an amazing combination. His power can't be measured. So let me just give you a little thought about just the whisper of his power, just a minor display of his power. I think every one of us take it for granted, but it happens before our eyes every day. Here it is. Here it is. Every morning as he brings up the sun over the horizon, that sun is 138,000 kilometres thick. 1.3 million times heavier than the earth. Blazing on its cool edge at 1 million degrees centigrade. Yet every morning at exactly the same time. Because everything is upheld by the word of his power. That sun comes up. And runs its course across our sky. And without it, life would not exist. And it drops again and we enjoy the beautiful sunsets, especially in winter time. We enjoy those beautiful sunsets as the master just displays his glory all again. And it's all because he is omnipotent omnipotent you can trust the one whose shadows you are hiding under he's called the almighty because he knows all and he has all power deuteronomy 10 verse 17 says for the lord your god is the god of gods the lord of lords the great and the mighty and the awesome god let me move on to the third attribute of god omnipresent He's everywhere at all times. You can never escape him. Once again, the psalmist said that. You can run to the highest hill and you can't escape him. You can go to hell and you can't escape him. You can go to the deepest oceans and you can't escape him. We know a fellow in the Bible that tried to do that. His name was Jonah. (laughs) But he was a sensible fella. (laughs) While he was in the belly of that big fish, he thought, hmm, Mm, I think I'm going to be stuck in here unless I call out to the Almighty. Mm, I think I'll pray to the Almighty. <laughs> and the Almighty heard him. Amen. And commanded that big fish, just go spew him up over there. That's a good place to go. See, the Almighty has everything in control. He listens to your cry. And he's ever present. Ever present. Hebrews 13, I've used this passage of Scripture in the Amplified Bible at many a home over the years. Many a home, I've used this passage of Scripture. And uh, Hebrews 13 in the Amplified Bible says, Let your character, your moral essence, your inner nature be free from the love of money. Shun greed. Be financially ethical. Being content with what you have, for he has said, here it is, I will never under any circumstances desert you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support, nor will I in any degree leave you helpless, nor will I forsake or let you down or relax my hold on you, assuredly not. Never, ever, 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 not, ever, will I ever let you down, nor give up on you, ever, 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 never will I ever give up on you. I'll always be with you, always beside you. In fact, in Psalm 139, he says, I go before you and behind you, and my hand of blessing 
is upon your life. I go before you and behind you, and my hand of blessing is upon your life. 1 Peter 4.19 says, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as a faithful creator, in doing good as a faithful creator. He's always there, he's always good, and he'll always be faithful in doing good in your life. Well, Pastor Ivan, what are some things that are happening in my life? I don't think they're good. He's in charge of all of that too. And in the end, he's going to turn it around for his good in your life. And your life will be far greater blessed in the end. In the end. Number five, God is immutable. God is immutable. He cannot change. He cannot change. God cannot. Notice that? Notice that key word. He cannot change. We find that hard as humans because we're changing all the time. Yeah, we change with the weather. We all say that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. One moment we can be happy. The next moment we get a text message and we're sad. Yeah. The next message we get a phone call and say, someone's had a baby and we're excited again. We're changing. But God never changes. God never changes because he cannot change. Wow, this gives us awesome and incredible, once again, security. Why can't he change, Pastor Ivan? Why can he not change? Doesn't the Bible say that at times he changes his mind? Oh, yes, he does. But his essence cannot change. His essence of his being cannot change. Why? Because he's perfect. The only reason you change and need to change is because you're not perfect. Hello, no nudge the person next to you now. No nudging, no looking to the side. <laughs> None of us are perfect, right? If you stayed with me over a 24-hour period, right, and went and did something for 24 hours, you'd discover very quickly that I'm not perfect, all right? Okay? Yeah. We need change. And that's why Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 3.18 that as we behold Jesus, as we behold our Lord and our God who is perfection, who will never change, we see him and we see this perfection that he is. And by the Spirit of God, then we desire change. And he said, then you will be changed from glory unto glory unto glory. He cannot change. I love that. The other reality too is, is that he cannot lie. And I'm so glad that he cannot lie, but I'm not going to go there this morning. If God could change, there would be great uncertainty. And none of us want that. We want great certainty. So do we believe? Are we going to rest in his promises? Are we going to rest in the security knowing that God is who he is? Are we going to allow his grace to enlarge your hearts, to believe the greater, for greater things and see things that he sees? Allow him to do what he knows best for us rather than spit the dummy when it doesn't happen the way that we want to do? Are we going to trust God? What is it? We're going to do the greatest thing we can do, and that is to know that he's faithful and trustworthy and stand upon his faithful promises. God's word says to us this. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we've asked of him. Can God change that promise? No. Everybody say no. God can't change that promise. He's unchanging. When he makes a promise, he's a covenant-keeping God. Therefore, he's a promise-keeping God. Once he makes a promise, he keeps his promise. So this is the confidence that we can have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. His promises are powerful. And therefore, we don't walk in uncertainty at any time. He promises to heal. Is that right? Does he promise to heal every time? No, he doesn't promise to heal every time. He doesn't say that. But he does promise to heal Notice in this verse in 1 John 5, this is the confidence that we have in him. Notice that, that statement, in him. 
I love that. He's a personal God. He's an ever-present God. He's never lying God. He's a total truthful God. He's a, he, he's a God who's, who's all-powerful. He can always do it. Whatever he sets his heart to do, whatever he determines to do, it tells us in Scripture again and again, he will do. But God doesn't stamp his approval on my plans. He only ordains and authorizes his plans because they're perfect and his plans are best. And so he's got to wait until we'll humble our heart and come to that recognition that I'm wanting my plans and not his plans. And then I change my ways and I begin to pray, Father, just surprise me. I'm out. I've been praying the same prayer for three months and nothing's happened and I've come to realize it's just my plans and not yours. So, Lord, I'm out. (laughs) I've been there many times. Lord, I'm out. (laughs) Now surprise me. And you know what? Every time he surprises me, it's better, much better than what I ever was demanding and throwing missy fits about and having carnal carnal, uh, tantrums about. His plans are always better. Let me tell you a secret. My wife has been saying to me privately, to nobody else, but saying to me privately for at least 25 years, I want to move to the Sunshine Coast. Listen now, listen. I want to move to the Sunshine Coast. Our Heavenly Father knows everything. Is that right? Everything. He knows her heart. When I resigned from the ministry, two weeks after I resigned from the ministry, in December 2022, God spoke to me and said to me, I've got another season for you to serve me. You will not have to grope for it. That was the word. You will not have to grope for it. You will not have to go look for it. You will not have to tell anybody about anything about it. I want you to totally keep quiet about it. But I want you to remain humble, cheerful, and patient. The third one was the hardest one. Patient was the hardest one. Nearly 12 months to that day, Pastor Rod phoned. And that's another story about how that came about. Because we told nobody. So our father had plans to bring us here from eternity past. From eternity past. But he also wanted to bless one of his daughters with the desire of her heart. Because that's what he does. Because that's what he does. He heals all our hurts from all the messes we've got ourselves in in the past because that's what grace does. Not instantaneously. It takes time. It's a journey. But if we'll stick close to him because we're going to trust him and not my feelings. Oh, please, don't trust your feelings. Hand all your feelings over to the one who can feel all your feelings for you and inform you clearly what it's all about because he knows everything that's going on in your heart. Let me finish off. So what have we got to do? I tell you what we've got to do. We've got to look to Jesus. We've got to look to Jesus. He's our greatest example. If you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you'll either become arrogant or depressed. One of the two. And both is pride. Depression is pride and arrogance is pride. And God Hates pride. In fact, he walks away from pride, but he gives grace and more grace to the humble. If you look to God, here it is, you'll be at rest. Write that down. If you've not written anything else down today. If you look to God, you will be at rest. At rest in your heart. At rest in your soul. It's called contentment. Contentment. Contentment in God is not containment. If you are content in God, it doesn't mean you're contained. It means you're expecting more, but you're letting him bring it when he's going to bring it because when he knows that you can handle what he's going to bring to you, he's going to bless you and not cause you to fall apart. Yeah. When you look to God, you're going to be at rest. Looking to Jesus, that's the basis of our faith and our trust. He's a God who is a promise declarer and a promise keeper. And the reason you hold on to that promise is because you believe that God who, who made it is not going to change his mind. I would rather, certainly rather a divine foundation for my belief rather than a man-made idea. My faith and hope are in the resurrection of Jesus and the reality that he went to heaven and sent forth the Holy Spirit as he promised. We trust to the measure of the trustworthiness of the person we are building a relationship with. Our God is faithful, eternally faithful, so we can place our trust and our hope in him. Jade, please come. 
Last scripture, Hosea 6 verse 3. I read through the book of Hosea this week. And if you take one of those words for the day off the table up there for yourself or for the teenagers, you'll follow together with me through the word of God because that was the reading this week out of Hosea. And this verse jumped out, Hosea 6 verse 3. It says this, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord our God. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord our God. Let's not just have a Sunday school understanding of who our God is. Let's grow in that understanding. And we do, as we dig into the Word of God, as we look at great reading material and great Christian books about the attributes of God, His essential attributes, His moral attributes, about the nature of God, about who He is. Our trust and our faith in God will grow. So let us know and let us press on to know the living God. Let's stand in His presence. It's wonderful to be with you here today, to be around the Word of God. Tonight, we have the combined services at the Uniting Church. Bring a plate of food for fellowship afterwards. Next Sunday, we'll be here having an awesome celebration because Jesus is alive. And I nearly forgot, but don't forget, for those that are members, we have an AGM Tuesday week. We'll have it up on the screen next Sunday. You would have received an email if you were a member. You would have received an email about that a couple of weeks ago. So don't forget about that and lock that in and be there for that. But we'll put all the details up on the screen next week for that. But it's lovely to have you here. If you need prayer today, this altar is the gate of heaven. That's what this altar is. It's the gate of heaven. Jacob was on the run from his brother and his father because he deceived his father. And the Bible says that he laid his head upon a rock. I don't know how that goes. I certainly wouldn't go to sleep if I laid my head on a rock. <laughs> but he laid his head on a rock and God brought a dream about angels ascending and descending. And when he woke up, he said, this is the gate of heaven. This is Bethel. Well, this is the gate of heaven. You don't come because you're broken and bruised and battered. You come because you know he's the Lord Almighty. Hallelujah. And you can meet with him here in a special way and have my faith and my wife's faith and others' faith join with you in prayer. Briefly, that the presence of God, the tangible presence of God, the manifest presence of God will come upon your life. So let's worship him as you just come right now in Jesus' name.